Camp Zephyr. I tell you, a window into my weird little mind, like, I feel like we're finally a legit church because we're going to Camp Zephyr. We've never gone to Camp Zephyr before. And a kid, a product of the 70s and the 80s, I, I, I went to Camp Zephyr several times. I'm sure my wife did. My mother went to Camp Zephyr, not the same year I did, but she went when she was a kid. And so, like, we're finally a church that goes to Camp Zephyr. So, uh, tell you what, um, men and women, I'm trying to decide if I should call them boys and girls, youth, youth, guys and, 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 and gals, uh, as a result of camp, um, 20 years later, end up on the mission field. 20 years later, end up behind a pulpit preaching. I don't want to make too much of camp, but I don't want to make too little of camp either. It, it's, it's a big deal, and the more, the more kids we can send, which takes dollars and cents, the more kids that we can send to camp. I, I'm excited about Camp Zephyr, so yay, yay Pastor Billy, and yay Icon. All right. Well, hey, welcome. I was sick and out last week, and we got people sick and out la- this week, and we got people not sick, but still, you know, concerned about other people being sick, and, and I, I'm predicting maybe another week or two of this, and then people are going to kind of start, start feeling comfortable going. I'm not, I'm not predicting the, the, the future health of, of, of us as a, as a people. I'm just saying that's what I'm expecting, is that maybe in a week or two, things are going to be back to normal, and people be back to doing their normal public things. Uh, but anyway, I was, I, was, I was actually better by Sunday uh, but I didn't want to come here out of a, an abundance of caution. I stayed home. I know some of you did last week. There are people staying home this week out of an abundance of caution. Uh, but I say that because as I was praying for you this morning, as I was preparing to preach this morning, there was this, um, there was this sense that I had that the Holy Spirit was was, 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 was reminding me once again, you know this, like it's the preacher that needs to be reminded of this, um, but he was reminding me once again that, that in God's sovereignty, just, just the right people will be here today. And in, in, a, in, a, in a hand-picked sort of fashion, the, the, the Lord has brought you here today. And so I think it begs the question, well, why? I mean, unless you think you're here randomly, or unless you think that perhaps you, or unless you think, unless you came out of some sort of guilt or obligation, which that may be true for five to ten percent of us, but, but even in your case, the Lord has brought you here providentially, and so I think it's a fair question to ask: Why might might the Lord have something for you this morning? You've heard me use the phrase um, before that if we are able to quiet the noise that we bring with us, if we're able to quiet the noise of the world and our situation, then perhaps we might actually hear the voice of God. We might actually experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. We know He's here. We know He's here. But oh, that we might actually experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So, So there are a few... There are a few of you, perhaps more than a few of you, there are some of you here today who have in recent history experienced deep disappointment. It might, have, it might be relational disappointment. It might be professional or vocational disappointment. Something that you expected might happen, and then all of a sudden it didn't happen. There are those of us here this morning, and if we were all super honest and super transparent, it might be many of us who, who would say that we have, I have recently experienced disappointment, Pastor Randy. And so what, what the Lord has made me keenly aware of this morning is that the, today's message from His Word is for you. It is for you. So we are now about three weeks into the book of Philemon. Um, 
And as I've said uh, several times now, we hardly ever get to hear anyone preach through the book of Philemon. Why? Because it's, it's, only, uh, it's, it's just one chapter. It's 20-something verses, so it's super short. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it is the topic is one that is very personal in nature. It's written to Philemon regarding Philemon's own junk, his own baggage, his own situation. And yet, and yet, the Apostle Paul writes it to Philemon and the church that meets in your house. And so his very private matter becomes a very public matter because in God's economy, that's how we roll in the church. You uh, don't really have the freedom. It's not it's not me as, it's not my obligation placed on you, but it's, it's the Lord's obligation placed on you. We don't really have the freedom to have our own private mess that we hide from one another when we come to church. Our private messes become public messes, and we share them and work through them together. And so that's, uh, but, it, but, but anyway, the reasons why Philemon doesn't get preached, number one, it's super short. Number two, it's about a very private matter. And number three, it's somewhat vague exactly exactly what Paul is expecting of Philemon. It's generally clear, but there are some specifics that are left to the imagination, I suppose. Nonetheless, nonetheless, I'm excited. I love this book. I'm excited about this book, and so we're going to continue on for a few more weeks. Let me give you a review briefly, or the backstory briefly, because... Some of you have been here before, some of you have slept since I preached two weeks ago, and so let's, let's, uh, let's remind, uh, let, let me remind you what it's about. Philemon is the, <clears throat> the addressee, he's the recipient of this letter that Paul wrote while in prison, perhaps in Rome, we don't know for sure, but, but quite possibly he's imprisoned in Rome. We know he's in prison. Recipient of the letters, Philemon, he was apparently a man of wealth and privilege, and he had, he had a slave who is now a runaway slave whose name is Onesimus. So we've got Paul the writer, we've got Philemon the recipient of the letter, and we've got this other fellow, Onesimus, who is perhaps a runaway slave. And, and so he, he, yes, he... He is a slave. Uh, I want to be really clear, as clear as I can, historically, uh, regarding slavery in that time. Uh, most, most scholars agree that, get this, that in the Roman world, that was the known Western world of that day, Asia Minor and several other regions making up the, the known Roman world. In that day, in that day, approximately... 20% of the population were slaves. So, I don't want to excuse the, 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 uh, the, the, the reality of slavery in that day. We believe that in, in the dignity and the value and the worth of every individual, and we believe in um, the right to freedom and... and, and, and and yet, what I, what, if we're going to study this letter carefully, what we need to realize is we cannot equate the slavery that Onesimus lived under and the slavery of the antebellum South in the tragic history of the United States. They're not, they're not the same. There are some similarities, and that is the oppression of human dignity, value, and worth, but they're not the same. You can't superimpose antebellum South slavery on the book of Philemon. Nonetheless, there are some, some similarities. So about 20% of, of the known world were living in some form of slavery. You should also know that, that slavery was not the lowest rung in this, in this uh, you know, human uh, ranking of, of, of who is and isn't significant. In, in fact, in fact the, uh, the, the, the lowest to be destitute and unemployed, though a free man in that day, that was considered a lower class of existence um, than, than slavery. Let me say that again. 
If you in the Roman world in that day, we're talking about uh, just a few centuries uh, or, or a few decades after, after Jesus' uh, death, burial, resurrection, ascension. In that day, if you were free, but you were destitute, unemployed, and homeless, that would have been a lower social tier or rung than to be employed, though oppressed, as a slave. In a seminary class, I heard one, uh, one student who was, it's been a while, so I can't remember if he was from South America or India, but he spoke of the very real tension in his church, in his church, because in his church, this was, this was you know, in the last 50 years, uh, that he, he was, uh, that, there's, that there's this caste system in his country, and therefore when you walk into the church, like we walk into the church today, you've got a caste system. That means a ranking system. So imagine if you are a six, and you're the most privileged, and maybe you own a, a business, and you have uh, employees, and then maybe you've got some threes and fours who work for you uh, because you're the employer, you're six, and they're threes and fours, and then maybe you've got some people that are just totally down and out, and they're ones, and then all of you come to church together, and then at the end of the church, can we really, can, can, a, can, a, can a one and a six, you know, go out for lunch at Subway at the end of the, at the, end of the church? You see the tension. Um, and, and so that's, that's messy, and that's what we have here in today's story because we've got, we've got the Apostle Paul, who's a Christian, and he has led, he has led uh, uh, years ago Philemon, the slave owner, to, to, to Christ, and he's, a, he's now a person of faith. Then we've got Onesimus, the runaway slave, who's now being sent back to Philemon, who has recently come to faith. How in the world are we all supposed to function in the body of Christ? Sixes and threes and ones. So Philemon was a Christian. Onesimus had, had evidently run away from Colossae, the city, to Rome where Paul is in prison and he had, he had come to faith in Jesus and now Onesimus, uh, now Paul is sending Onesimus back. And, 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 and Paul's, uh, Paul's request is that Philemon would receive Onesimus back as a brother in Christ. But actually, that's not where we're going today. We're gonna, you need to know that, that data point. We're getting there next week and the following week. The, the letter as a whole is, is, yes, about how Philemon... Um, is to receive Onesimus back. But today what I really want to camp out on is how Paul leads Philemon <clears throat> to process disappointment, a runaway slave. And how might this, in God's economy, how might this be used for good? If you've brought with you today a, a suitcase full of disappointments, I think it's fair for us to ask that same question. How might my disappointments in God's economy, if God is sovereign, then He is sovereign over, and His ways are at times, in fact, always beyond my comprehension. How might my disappointment in God's economy ultimately be for good? Messy, isn't it? Let's jump in and read Philemon. We've got a lot of verses today compared to the last, the previous two weeks. Um, Philemon 8 through 16. If we're not careful, careful we'll read the whole, the whole letter because uh, it's so short. But this is, this is the first week in which we get into the appeal, the actual body of the letter. Week one, I preached the opening. Week two, I preached the Thanksgiving. And this is week three, and we're now... We're going to spend two weeks in the body of the letter. The body of the letter. Begin with verse 8. Hear the, word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul says, therefore, remember he, he gave thanks for Philemon. That was all, we already read that. Therefore, 
Although in Christ I could be bold <clears throat> and order you to do what you ought to do. I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer, he says, I, I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is none other than I, or than, than, than Paul. It is not, I'm sorry, it is as None other than Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, formerly he was useless to you. But now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am, I am sending him who is my very heart. Remember that word from last week or last time I preached? Splankna. His, his guts, his innards, his, his, the seat of his emotions. He, he's my very heart. Onesimus is my very heart. But I'm sending him back to you. Verse 13. <clears throat> I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place, Philemon, he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Verse 15, perhaps the reason he was separated for you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Verse 16 is the controversial verse. Exactly what does he mean by this? It says, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. <clears throat> He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Dignity, value, and worth. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, so Paul in verse 9 and 10, maybe we could just go back to those as I, because I'm going to be kind of jumping around. I really encourage you to bring your Bible during this study, and then we're going to go immediately into Colossians Bring your Bible and just camp out and take notes and study the Word in your lap, on your phone, on your iPad, whatever. All right, so verses 9 and 10, in these verses, um, Paul seeks to persuade Philemon to do the right thing and receiving Onesimus back. But he, 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 he attempts to persuade him Philemon to do it of his own accord, without compulsion. He says, on the basis of love, I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love, he says. <clears throat> he, he, he has no interest, he says. He has no interest in uh, commanding Philemon to do so. He says in verse, verse 9, I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. What a great rhetorical tool. In other words, if you're, if you're studying um, how to persuade people and how to talk, even, even that, even if, you, even if you right now don't even give a rip about Jesus, I mean, that's tragic. But even if we were there, Philemon is just a wonderful book on how to lead people, how to persuade people. What, a, what an interesting rhetorical tool. I, look, man, I'm, I'm, I, could, I could command you, but I'm not going to. I prefer <clears throat> to, to, on the basis of love, persuade, appeal. Now, I often, often with my children, with people whom I have influence over, I often start at this point. I prefer to appeal uh, on the basis of love. 
But then eventually it's like, forget it. Just do what I say, okay? Right? Like you just get to that point where you just like, I'm going to throw my weight around. I'm going to command you because I can. But that, Paul doesn't go there. In fact, there's an inclusio. Later on, he's going to come, like this is the beginning of, of, of the appeal. And later on, he's going to do it again. He's going to appeal based on the basis of love. His method of persuasion is, is interesting. I mean, he deals, he deals in the next few verses in order. He deals with Three relationships, and we're going to look at those briefly. He deals with his relationship um, to Onesimus. If you kind of think of a triangle, he's going to talk about, he's going to first talk about his, Paul's relationship with Onesimus, the runaway slave. And then, second, he's going to talk about his relationship to Philemon. And then, finally, he's going to, in today's letter, in today's section, talk about Philemon's relationship as the employer or the boss or the, the slave owner, his relationship to Onesimus, the runaway slave. So let's look at those relationships because healing is always about relationships. First, Paul's relationship to Onesimus. Onesimus has become a Christian under Paul's uh, ministry, apparently, and he is now, I don't even like this word, but it's an apt, it's an apt translation. This, the NIV chooses to use the word. He is useful. Paul says that he is useful uh, to Paul in his imprisonment. Uh, he means it in the highest sense. He is, he is about, Paul is about the gospel ministry, about sharing the, the, the name, fame, glory of Jesus, and seeing people come to faith in Jesus, and he says, <clears throat> Onesimus has been useful to me in the, the propagation of the gospel. In fact, he says, he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. So he says he's useful. Uh, perhaps more importantly, he says in verse 16, um, he is uh, a dear brother uh, in, in verse 10, he refers to uh, Onesimus as, as his son, like his spiritual son. And then in, in uh, which verse was it? He refers to him as my very heart. Splunkna, the word that we talked about last week. He's saying, he's, he's, he's saying Onesimus to me is... It's a big deal. My, me sending him back to you, Philemon, is a big deal because I love him with all my heart. He is my very own heart. He is my brother. He is my son. He is useful in my ministry of planting churches, and yet I'm going to send him back. Second relationship, Paul's relationship to Philemon. <clears throat> Philemon had apparently also come to faith under Paul's ministry. And Philemon apparently had not just come, under, come to faith under his ministry, but he was intricately involved in Paul's ministry because Paul says, Onesimus has, has for the moment taken your place in serving me while I am in chains for the gospel. And Paul, remarkably, and I'll tell you why I say it's remarkable, rem- remarkably, Paul uh, does not lord his authority over Philemon. I said this week one, but the book of Philemon, you know, Paul wrote numerous books in the New Testament, um, the numerous letters, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, and so on. I've left a few out. Um, <clears throat> very seldom does he not begin the letter by saying, "I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, I have authority. Jesus came and visited me directly. I had direct communication with Jesus. I am an apostle, just like the twelve apostles that." that followed Jesus during his three years of ministry. I am an apostle of Christ. I'm an apostle of Christ. He says it 
He says it in most of his letters. But if you go back, we're not going to today, but if you go back to the beginning of Philemon, in this letter, he chooses to leave that out. And he, he refers to himself uh, not as, a, <clears throat> as, a, uh, as an apostle, but rather a prisoner of Christ. Now, why do you think he does that? And then in today's letter, he does that. Remarkably, he does not lord over his authority, but rather, he, he, uh, look how he refers to himself. He says, he, he says, I'm an old man. In today's passage, he says, I'm an old man. Philemon, I'm, a, I'm an old man. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a prisoner. He says, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm in chains for the gospel. Clearly, these words, again, uh, a masterful example of, of, of rhetoric and the art of persuasion. Clearly, these words are designed to win Philemon's sympathy or at least cause him to let down his guard, to let down his guard. You know, sometimes our conflict with someone else, in fact, perhaps many times, often, your conflict with someone else is not because of the issue at hand, but because you come at that person with pride or with aggression or with feigned authority. <clears throat> but, 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 but Paul, we see, he's mastered this, this art. Uh, he's able to humbly and yet genuinely, humbly and genuinely approach Philemon with this request. Look, I'm an old man. I'm broke down. I'm changed. I'm prisoner for Jesus Christ's name, I've got a request for you. Could you do this for, for me, old man Paul? All right, so those are two, the first two relationships, um, Paul's relationship to Onesimus, Paul's relationship to Philemon, and now the last, the third, Philemon's relationship to Onesimus. For whatever reason, for whatever reason, Paul, in this passage that we read today, Paul refers to Onesimus as formerly useless. That's what he says. He says, he was, he was formerly useless, but now he is useful. And again, don't trip up on the word, that the, the fact that the English word translation is somewhat demeaning. In the original, that, Paul is not being demeaning. In fact, he's esteeming Onesimus when he says, I know, I know, Philemon, Onesimus used to be useless to you, but now he's a new man. He's a new man in Christ. He's useful. Perhaps Onesimus had defrauded, we don't know, he perhaps had defrauded Philemon, he'd stolen from Philemon. It, it seems as though he'd run away as a slave from Philemon. We just don't know the details, but we, what we do know are that the details, they're not pretty because Paul is willing to concede, hey, I know Onesimus, he was formerly useless. I, I know that. But he's a new man. Paul makes this one thing clear. Now, in Christ, Onesimus is Philemon's brother in the Lord. And that changes everything. The gospel the story of Jesus, his work on the cross, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. The gospel changes the nature of your relationships. You can't look at people in the old way. I, I'm sorry, but you can't look at people like maybe your tribe does with disdain or judgment. You now, as a Christ follower, you're obligated to look at people through a different lens, the lens of the gospel. You see them now through a different light. <clears throat> Paul says, Onesimus, he was, he was formerly useless. He is now my very heart, and I am sending him back. And then in verse 15, 14, this inclusio, kind of a bookends on either side. Again, he re revisits the, the idea, this is a favor. I'm asking you to do me this favor. I want it to be voluntary. I don't want it to be forced. Would you please do this of your own accord? And now, the rest of the time together today is where I want to camp out, and that's verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> and this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time, and this is where we're going to deal with our own disappointments as we look at how 
Paul deals with Philemon's disappointment. The emotions of this scenario between Onesimus and Philemon beg the question that all emotional, relational tensions ask. And that is, what was even the point of all this drama? In any emotionally tense, relationally tense drama that you've gone through, you ask that question. Have you ever thought, I, I, I wish I had never even met that person. He became, she became a close friend, all the memories, and now it's just all ended, and it's not, needless pain. I wish I had never even met you. And of course, we don't, we don't mean that, but we feel that. Philemon must be asking the question, what, what good could come from this? Why, why, does, why has Paul sent me a letter? What good... How might God possibly salvage this situation, bring good out of heartache? And that's a fair question, and, and I think it's a question that we often ask ourselves. So this is where Paul's going. And appropriately, I think we've got just verse 15. Um, <clears throat> it, it's important to, to, to look at that very first word in verse 15, and pause there for just a moment. Perhaps another good translation there would be, uh, would be possibly, Paul, what would Paul say? He say, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. We're going to get to what he, we're, we're going to get to the rest of it, but if we could just spend a minute on that word, perhaps, appropriately, gently, because Paul's about to wade into the water of God's sovereignty in broken, fractured relationships, right? He's about to wade into that water. Why did this relationship spiral, and um, why all the heartache Paul's about to wade into the, the waters of God's sovereignty in that situation, but he begins gently, because he's, he's a kind man, he begins gently with perhaps, possibly. Have you ever had someone in your life who, quickly, who would quickly tell you God's purpose and will for your life, like you just had a breakup or whatever, and like, well, here's the purpose, here's what God intends for you in all of this, and you're like, slow down, man. But not Paul. Paul is, is gentle. I mean, he's, he's taken all these verses to, to, to give thanks and to pray for Philemon and to celebrate who he is and to esteem him, and now he gently moves into these waters. He says, perhaps, perhaps, <clears throat> if God is sovereign, sovereign, it means that he controls everything. Perhaps if God is sovereign. And perhaps if we're, going to, if we're going to ascribe to Him sovereignty and therefore blame Him for the mess of our lives. Let me say that again before I, before I give you the third. If, if God is truly sovereign and we are, we are going to blame Him as the sovereign one for, for, for the hurt in our lives, the sovereign one, then isn't it also good and right for us to say as the sovereign one, perhaps his purposes, his plans are, are, are hidden, but they're good. We don't know them yet, but there's good to come. So he says perhaps possibly, let me remind you that Paul is, of course, quite qualified to speak regarding the, this, this possible underlying 
providential work of God in, in unfortunate events? Like, Paul, Paul has the authority to speak on this. Why? Because he was <clears throat> a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Literally, he had been enslaved, he had been enchained and imprisoned because he was a Christ follower, because he wouldn't shut up. He kept preaching Jesus, and he, he actually was, was uh, imprisoned because of that. And so, perhaps no biblical author can speak with more firsthand experience regarding the, the sometimes seemingly tragic nature of God's providence in the broken system of the world that we live in. I mean, he can speak firsthand. Look, there's been a lot of tragedy in my life, and yet I, I'm looking for the good in it. <clears throat> Friends, eternal gain often comes out of temporary loss. It's a fact in God's economy. Eternal gain often comes out of temporary loss. So Paul is stating in a careful and gentle and a guarded way that perhaps God may have brought this separation between Philemon and Onesimus to pass in order that he might ultimately reunite them for eternity as brothers or as, as brothers in Christ. <clears throat> like all speculation regarding God's sovereignty, Paul is cautious and encouraging at the same time. Paul suggests Onesimus' flight may have been orchestrated by God himself so that Onesimus might meet me, Paul. He might encounter the gospel. He might become a Christ follower. He might become Philemon's spiritual brother and ultimately be returned to Philemon in this new status forever. Not merely as a slave, but more than a slave, a brother in Christ. <clears throat> Think on Philemon's perspective. He is probably not feeling the, the warm and fuzzy vibes that that Paul is serving up. This is not an easy hurdle to clear. When someone has let you down, hurt you, you've been deeply disappointed in a person, in a circumstance, <clears throat> let me say, let me speak into your life the same word. Perhaps, possibly, in that brokenness that you've experienced, maybe even in recent days, perhaps, possibly, God is right in the middle of it. Working out something for your eternal good. Now we should be slow to determine the providential pur purposes of God in our struggles. But His purposes are there and we should look for them. We should search for them. We should be slow and prayerful and measured in the process. in looking for the reason, but there is a reason. There is a purpose. If God is who we say that He is, then there is a purpose. All right, so here's, here's where we're going to land the plane today. I'm going to give you three quick thoughts, maybe not too quick, but three summary thoughts answering this question. When asking what God's purpose in disappointment might be, maybe that's you. It's like, what is God's purpose? purpose in disappointment. I bet Paul behind, behind bars, uh, behind, you know, in prison, I bet, he, I bet he asked that question. You know, I've been reading, um, I've been reading through the Bible like many of you are, and you know, you get to that point where Joseph is in, is, is in, uh, is in the dungeon, or you know, he's in the, just an awful mess, Joseph, and he must be asking, like, what What's God's purpose? God's purpose in disappointment, and, and maybe you today are asking that same question. Here are my thoughts. 
based on what Paul says to Philemon. Number one, trust God's timing, God's economy, and God's perspective. Where, where do we find that in this passage? We find it in, in when Paul says to Philemon, think on this, Philemon. He says, imagine, imagine this. Just check this out. Like, like, let's just try this on. Like, he was separated from you for a little while. It's interesting. He doesn't say he ran away from you. He, you know, he did you wrong. He doesn't want to, like, let's not, let's not, yes, but let's not think on that for a moment. Paul says, perhaps separated for a little while so that he might be returned as a brother in Christ forever. It's like, that's a good math equation. Like, like that's a good outcome. That's a good investment. If we're going to invest pain toward ultimate good, then that's a good investment of our pain. He says, he left you, he hurt you, separated for a little while, but what if perhaps God's purpose, possibly what God's doing here, separated for a little while so that he might be returned as a brother in Christ forever. Let us trust God's timing, God's economy, His, His, His system, <clears throat> and His perspective, His sovereign perspective. Number two, <clears throat> ask, ask God why. I think that's always always a question that, that, that God will receive. Uh, why, God? Well, why did this happen? I ask God, but, but don't dwell on the question. Rather, dwell on the Lord. In my darkest days where I, <clears throat> I, uh, I asked the question, why, like, why did this even happen? Why did I even meet that person? I wish I never even would have gone. I feel like the last three years were just a waste. Why didn't I? I asked that question, but maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you've experienced this. When I dwell on the Lord, not on the question, when I dwell on the Lord, there just seems to be such a tenderness that the Father bestows or that the Father, um, that I experience in dwelling on the Lord. Even in the midst of, uh, of an unanswered question, like, why? But Lord, may I dwell on you now. Ask God why. That's a fair question. But don't dwell on the question. Rather, dwell on the Lord. Next week and the following week, we're going to deal a little more with the question of what about the slavery piece, right? I'm not going to spend too much time on that today or really any time, but but he does say, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave. Notice he doesn't say, no longer a slave. This is the tension in the book, and this is why some people don't even like the book, and this is why it doesn't maybe, one of the reasons why maybe it doesn't get preached, like, what's he asking? Is he asking him to write a, a certificate of freedom? We don't. No, what you need to understand is that Christianity in the Roman world was a very, very tiny movement, and, 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 and they were mostly poor people. In fact, a higher percentage of them would have been slaves, and so how they might change this system in that day, um, that doesn't seem to be the main point that Paul is making. Now, is, it, is, is, is slavery even tenable? In, in the church, when Paul is calling them to be co-equal brothers and sisters in Christ, I mean, that's the question. It perhaps is no longer even tenable. But that is not the point of this letter, it seems. The main point, God cares for our circumstances, but he's ultimately about our hearts. God cares about your circumstance, but ultimately... He's about your heart. <clears throat> Third, last, last statement I'll make today is this. Uh, focus all your energy in periods of disappointment. 
on relationships. It's so easy to isolate one's self, to decide never to be hurt again. Um, life is always about relationships. Let me say that again. Life is always about relationships. I, I struggle with that truth, that biblical truth at times, but it is a biblical truth. When you, where you go to school, where you cho- what, what you choose to do with your life, how you spend your money, life's as a Christian, always about relationships. Friday, I decided to go get a haircut. Doesn't it look nice? Um, I decided to go get a haircut, because yes, thank you. Because I love my wife, I decided to go get a haircut. If it it wasn't for my wife, I would look like I lived under a bridge. I, I wouldn't actually live under a bridge, but I would just look like I lived under a bridge, but, but anyway, I go to a haircut Friday, my wife. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, and so I did something that I haven't done the last two years, and that is I went to my old barber. Well, so Reuben, he's been cutting my hair for 50-something years. Now, I've, I was gone for a while, you know, in Albuquerque and Dallas, Fort Worth, but came back, but cut my hair for 50 years, and so he's, he's, he's an old dude, uh, and Triangle Barbershop, and he's been in the same place for... Um, since the since the sixties, um, and so I I went with this fear in my heart, and the fear was confirmed. Not that he uh, has, that not that he had passed away, but I went fearing that he'd finally you know hung up the scissors or whatever, hung up the apron, and so I went, and there was that that candy cane thing, and it wasn't spinning, you know, and the open sign wasn't there but it looked like the light was on, so I just peeked in the window, and, and there was a paint can, and there was, in the middle of the tile floor, and the barber's chairs were gone, and I just, my heart sunk. I'm like, ah, you know, he did. He finally, COVID, he finally retired, I guess, you know. So I felt bad that, like, I tried to remember the last time he cut my hair and the last conversation we had, and, I, and then I got back in my truck, and I, drove around. I called Lydia. I'm like, I'm not going to have a teenager cut my hair. So I got to find somebody, like an old man. He's at least got to be older than me. So I, I, it dawned on me, there's this other one. I'm not going to tell, tell you the name because I'm going to give you a little bit of the, 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 the dude's uh, story. But I, I went to this other barbershop that was old school. I mean, like my grandfather, I went, my, my dad and I went to Reuben. My grandfather went to this other guy, you know. And so I went there and I told him, you know, hey, I'm a Reuben cut my hair. He knew, he knew Reuben. Now I'm looking for a new barber. You're older than me, so you passed test number one. Let's see if you can cut hair. Uh, so I sat down, and, 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 and his, uh, his, he told me a little bit of a story. And his, <clears throat> his, uh, he'd been cutting hair for decades. He probably cut my hair when I was little, but his father had cut hair before him in the same location, and, and it just so happened, or, or the sovereignty of God. It just so happened that the day before he had buried his father, who had cut hair in that shop before he had. Now he's cutting. He's older than me. He's been cutting. Okay. So, so I sit down, and the first thing he asked me is, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a pastor. And he said, okay, I have some questions. And we, we spent the next, he's a really fast barber, Way faster than Reuben. But uh, he, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but in that time, he's also a fast talker. And so in that, in that moment, we got to, I answered some questions. and We talked about God, and we talked about his father passing away. We talked about my father passing away. What's my point in that long convoluted story? It's always about people. I, I'm, not, I'm not always good at remembering and realizing that. But life as a Christ follower is always about people. So where are you today? What's got you down? Could you possibly dare to ask 
what God's purpose in your disappointment might be. And I would say perhaps, possibly, might God have some great eternal purpose in your your temporary disappointment right now? Ask the Lord. He might answer. Amen. Let's pray. Can we just bow and enjoy the quietness of the moment? Um, Let me give you just a little bit of space now to, to admit to the Lord that there's something going on right now that's disappointing to you. We just, he knows, of course he knows, right? He knows everything, but just admit that to him. and Maybe in the quietness of this moment right now, just ask him, God, what? could you reveal to me, could you just open up the curtain of heaven just for a moment and just give me a, just give me a little bit of a picture of what you're doing here? Ask him that. And, and then perhaps possibly you want to say to the Lord what I perhaps possibly want to say to the Lord right now, and that is, even though I don't completely understand your purpose this morning in the pain, I trust that you're good. I trust that you do good. And I trust that there is eternal gain that's going to come out of this momentary disappointment. Perhaps you could just lean in to the Lord right now and just tell him that. We pray this in Christ's mighty name, amen.